Okay, so I've been trying to get over the allergy things and let the Claritin kick in and do all the whatevers so I can film, but I don't think that's happening because whenever I'm on Claritin, my brain just becomes complete and total mush. And so I'm just going to roll with it because we've got a new bath bomb playlist to get out, a back to basics, and I'm super duper excited about it. And so we're going to get to it. And if I am, you know, sniffling or doing whatever throughout any of this, I'm sorry, I'll try to cut them out, but also no promises. So that's that. We are about to dive in to a very big, very long playlist, as I said. So we're going to get to it as quickly as possible. I will tell you more about the playlist in just a minute. But before I do, hello, I am Mrs. Soap and Clay. Let's make stuff. How's it going, Sudzers? Welcome back to the channel. You are at Soap and Clay, where we make all the soapy things. And you are here for week 26 of year three. And as I said, we are doing a new Back to Basics playlist. And so this will be an eight parter that I will drop, I think, two or three videos a day to get all of the information to you as quickly as possible in one playlist all about bath bombs. Now I know we've talked about bath bombs a whole lot before, but in all honesty, I've let you in on a whole bunch of different tests that I've done, whether we be testing surfactants, extra bubblers, extra additives to prolong the fizz, to, you know, make the bombs float, etc. and so forth. But in reality, in order to do all of those, you have to learn the very, very basics. As the old saying goes, you have to walk before you can run. And really a lot of the tests that I've been doing would be what we would consider running in the bath bomb world. So we're going to take it back to basics today and we're going to teach you how to crawl. And by the end of this series, you will be walking. And then you can go back to all of the other tests and all the fun stuff that we've done within the extra ingredients and whatnot so you can start running. The overall goal with this playlist is to ensure that you have a good working baseline of what a bath bomb is, how it works, what to look for within your bath bomb powder and how to fix it then and there so you don't get there the next day and see warts on your bath bombs or very fragile bombs or cracks or all of the things that we very much hate seeing. And these are tips that will be good across all humidity levels. And the reason I know this is because recently we were going through all of the records and uh, we learned that I have made one million bath bombs. Over the course of Soap and Clay's history between wholesales and our retail sales and classes and testings and all of the things, we have made our one millionth bath bomb. And believe it or not, I've learned a thing or two in the process. So I'm going to share that information with you through this week, through this playlist. First up, we are going to be talking about the very, very basic chemical reaction of baking soda and citric acid, how it works, why it works, and what is the absolute most important ingredient to include in all of your bath bombs before you start playing with any of the extras, any of the butters, any of the polys, any of any of the things. We're going to go actually back to basics. So let's get to the video. We're going to make a series of bath bombs. We are going to do some drop tests. We are going to do some fizz tests in the overall with all of the bath bomb making. But we should go there and do those things quickly because all of these videos are going to take a crap ton of my time. So let's go do that. Okay, so today we are going back to basics in really big ways. And don't worry, throughout the rest of this playlist, we will definitely look at substitutions, how to, you know, put in fun stuff, all the things. But for right now, I think it is important for you to understand exactly how it is that bath bombs work 
and why certain ingredients are going to work better in a bath bomb and others are not going to work at all just based on the science and the chemistry behind it, right? And so what I have done here is I have two cups of baking soda in this container and I have since put in one cup of citric acid, which is a very common thing that you see in a lot of bath bomb recipes. They say to mix your dry ingredients and then add your wet. Now while that is sitting there in the corner, I am going to make bath bombs the regular way. So there is currently two cups of baking soda in each of these containers. And by the regular way, I mean my way, you know, two cups baking soda in each of these containers. I have put in my one tablespoon in total of scent, and I'm going to put in one tablespoon of a lightweight oil. So this particular case, I am using sunflower. Substitutions for that could be grapeseed, could be hemp, could be a lot of things. I am also going to put in one tablespoon into each of water. Water for me is the most important ingredient when you are working with bath bombs and this series, but certainly this video is going to explain to you why. So while I am mixing these, I'm going to let the container to the left continue to sit and I'm not going to do anything with it. To show you what happens when baking soda and citric acid are mixed together with no fluids, with no moisture whatsoever, right? And you probably are already aware what's going to happen, nothing. Even with the humidity in the air, the baking soda and the citric acid together are not going to be pulling enough of the moisture from the air. My humidity is sitting around 50% right now. I will show this at some point in the video to actually turn this powder into something that can be molded into a spherical shape. You do need some moisture. And so this is where the great debate always comes in. Well, what kind of moisture do I really need water? My bombs end up, you know, doing weird things or getting warts or whatever if I use water. So how about I use witch hazel? Why are my bombs always breaking? Why are they fragile? All of the things. And water is what people are always assuming is the biggest culprit. I disagree completely, and we are going to see that in this video. Now, again, in this, I do have a tablespoon of my scent, a tablespoon of my oil, a tablespoon of water, and I'm putting a tablespoon of polysorbate. Polysorbate is not a requirement. The only thing that polysorbate is going to do with all of this is emulsify the colors that I know I am putting on top of these bath bombs. So at the end of all of this, I am going to roll these in micas to make them a gold on the outside colored bomb. And because I'm doing that, I want to ensure that the micas are going to disperse evenly through the tub because micas, being a different type of particle than you know your FD and C colors, they like to clump and they like to stick to the side of the tub. So I don't want that. Polysorbate in and of itself is not going to provide anything as far as stability and ease of molding your bath bombs. But as you can see here, this is what texture you're going to be looking at when you have your one tablespoon of water in with your tablespoon of, you know, scent and the oil. I'm going to also show you what happens with this particular mixture here. As you see, it's very, very powdery, right? I cannot get that good clump. If I don't have that good clump, some moisture needs to be in this in order to turn this powder into, you know, a bomb, into a sphere. And so let's just start with putting in just the tablespoon of scent into this and mixing it in. And let's see if that is going to give us the consistency that we need to make a successful bath bomb. I love tests. This is fun for all of us. Now, because I have not put the citric acid into the two containers on the right, it can sit for reasonably as long as I need it to. Because the citric acid, when it has that water into in these two containers, the citric acid in that is going to start the process of fizzy liftoff because it's such a small amount of citric acid. You're not going to get the actual big explosion, but I'm sure you have come in contact with a lot of bath bomb recipes where you mix your dry ingredients, your baking soda and your citric acid together, and then go ahead and put your water in and it starts to bubble, right? We will also see that with this at some point throughout this series, but not in this particular video. But see there, it's a dry-ish ingredient. It's fine, 47% humidity. Now, the container on the left is something that I could mold into a bath bomb right now. But remember, I recently just made like my one millionth bath bomb. So I've been doing this for a long time. 
in all conditions, I can basically mold almost anything into an actual sphere. Now, the stability and the end result after it dries out is a different story entirely. The actual bath bomb itself and therefore the performance and its shipability and all of the things, those are definitely going to be more suspect in the previous container that I showed you, which I will show you within this video so you understand what we are what we are doing. But with these two, you can definitely tell that we have a lot more clump on the right than we do in the left. It's because of the added moisture, but really it's because of the water itself. Because what the water itself is doing, remember this is just a basic chem chemical reaction between baking soda and citric acid, right? You are forming a gas essentially when water comes in contact with your baking soda and your citric acid. So you put baking soda in its in a water in water, it doesn't do anything. You put citric acid in water, it doesn't do anything. You put those two combined in water, it does something. Fizzy liftoff. Bath bombs are born. So the water is a very important part for the actual fizz, but it is also a very important part for the actual structure and integrity of the bath bombs. Now you see how easy that process was. We're also going to do some weighing so we understand, you know, how much water weight they're going to lose, how much weight they're going to lose while they're firming up. So this one is sitting at about 7.8 ounces and realistically every bath bomb within this particular batch is going to be, be between uh, about 7.3 and 7.8. Now these particular molds that I am using, I love the plastic ones because it does give more give and it does allow you to form a bath bomb really beautifully. Now how I form bath bombs, because there is kind of a trick to that if your bath bomb recipe is bad and your mixture is the wrong consistency. So for this, I fill each side. I overflow it and then I press it down on each side. Now once it's both of them have been kind of packed in, it's a light pack on each side just to press with my palm, nothing crazy. I then put a mound onto one side and I squeeze them together. Easy peasy way to get a bath bomb out of a mold every single time. Now this particular batch here, the one that only has the scent in it, so we've got, that's all we have in there. We're going to try after it's been sitting for a little bit, just enough time for me to make five bath bombs. So you know, less than three minutes. We're going to try to make a bath bomb out of it. And as I said, I can mold almost anything. So this is going to work. But because of the consistency of it, we're going to end up with problems right away. And the problems that we are going to see is, yep, separating, but that's okay. I can put some more in and I can bang it more and really compress everything really nicely and ensure that this comes out of the mold. It is possible, but because this sand, this uh, mixture is so dry, it's like very dry sand. It's essentially like going to the beach and trying to build a sand castle out of sand that's just a little bit too far away from the water. You do need some water in this to maintain structure. Otherwise you're left with that. You see all the pox and a very difficult time getting it out of the mold. So this is not enough moisture, so that's fine. Let's go ahead and we'll try to add a tablespoon of oil into this as well. So still we're not using the water at all. And you know, we get the big benefit from the oil too because we want it to be skin loving, our bath bombs to be skin loving and not just fun. So cool, let's do that. I am going to make all of the bath bombs for this particular batch using nothing but the two cups citric acid, or the two cups baking soda, the one cup citric acid, the one tablespoon of scent, and the one tablespoon of oil. Not putting any water into it at all. So, in doing this, it looks like the clump is going to be pretty decent, right? You see the, the tutorials and the blogs online, they say, what, it should clump together kind of nicely in your hand in two or three places? Yeah, it was doing that, so great. Because that batch on the left does not have any water in it at this point, I know that there's no fizzy liftoff reaction occurring, so I have no risk of it drying out any further than what it currently is. So I'm going to leave that one alone and continue molding the bath bombs from this batch that still has the water within it. Because it does have the water, I added the citric acid last, and as soon as you add that citric acid to a solution that has water, you are on a bit of a time crunch. That time crunch is not obscene though. You know, I, out of all the classes that I've taught, I always see people's eyes get really big when I tell them that during that stage, that as soon as we put the citric acid in, you got to start moving. You have to, you know, be working with the bath bomb powder and creating your bath bombs 
because the longer it sits in that form, the more it's going to dry out. You need to get it into its form so it can dry out appropriately and form that crust, which is the entire point of the water. And that's why you need it in your bath bombs, even at high humidity. So with this particular batch, because I put that citric acid in and went ahead and molded an entire batch of bath bombs and then moved on and did some stuff with the left-hand side, it had been sitting for about... 10 to 15 minutes, and as you saw, there was no problems whatsoever molding the bath bombs. So again, it's you have a pretty good working time. I've definitely seen recipes and different weird things that we do within the soaps and cosmetics world where you do not have that work time at all. So it was really easy to mold those. They were not drying out. My batch was also not what I would call like sopping wet. I am going to show you some, some bath bomb batches that are very, very wet throughout the course of this playlist as well, and what you can do to fix it if it's overly wet, because you can do things to fix it if it's overly wet. If it's too dry, you sometimes don't know that until you go in the next day and you find that your bath bombs are incredibly fragile. So as you can see here, about the same weight, seven and a half ounces. So we are close-ish. We're within that range for all of this. Now, again, this is the stuff this is the recipe from the batch from the left side. So no water at all in this. And I can mold these. And I'm molding them essentially the exact same way, except I am using more force to compress them. Now, with these particular molds, if you use the plastic molds, a sure sign that your bath bomb batch is too dry is if your molds are cracking. I can use the exact same mold over and over again for hundreds of bath bombs and not crack a mold. The second that it cracks, it's two culprits. It's either the bath bomb powder is too dry, or I have underfilled the bath bomb mold. And unfortunately, when your bath bomb powder is too dry, getting more powder into it is not going to help the you know issue with cracking the mold, and it's also not going to help with the stability of the bomb itself. Because you are looking for, yes, we need to mold it into that shape so it will stay, but we only want it to stay long enough so that very slight amount of water that you've put into it is doing its thing with the baking soda and the citric acid, see, cracked mold, to firm it up and create effectively a crust all around the bath bomb itself so it's sturdy enough for shipping and it's not fragile and going to break. And let's look at all the results now. The four on the bottom, we have, okay, 49% humidity going on. So very, you know, similar to what we actually made these in. These did firm up overnight. The four on the bottom plus this one. These are the, the batches. These are the bath bombs from the batch that was on the left-hand side that did not have any water. This was the last one that I showed you that I had molded. It broke as soon as I took it off of the scale. So those four right here we're going to look at them and you can see how they're crumbling, right? There's a lot of bath bomb powder that's coming away from them. They're also sticking to the mold, which is something you always experience or I always experience with something that doesn't have water in it. And you see how it's crumbling away. This is already, I mean, just not a great bath bomb because you don't want all of this extra just powder kind of coming off of it. And the more you rub it, the more you're going to end up with powder all over your hands, all over the, you know, table, everywhere. So not a well-formed bomb. And these are the ones without the water. Now, for the other bombs that are up top, the nine that are up top, those are the ones that I made with the batches that each had the water, a tablespoon of water in it. And as you can see, if you roll it around in your hands, there's no powder. This is a very firm bomb. It's not crumbly at all. Nothing is coming off of it whatsoever. I mean, I am really rubbing this. That's because of the crust that's been formed because of the water. And that's going back to the one that was on the left without the water. That is what you get. Try it again. Nothing at all. There is nothing coming off of these bombs. And they are all weighing out at about the same amount once everything has been dried out as the ones that we had from the batch with the, you know, with no water in them. Now, the water ratios, I used a tablespoon and I had 50% humidity. I usually have in my area 
in my soaping area around 50% humidity at all times. I have made bath bombs wherein the humidity has been wildly higher, and I've shown you that in other videos. And uh, I don't change that amount of water. I always use, if I'm using two cups baking soda to one cup citric acid, it's going to be a tablespoon of water, tablespoon of oil, tablespoon of scent every single time. That said, if you're in a very high humidity area and you are finding that you're having problems with them being overly wet, yeah, decrease the water. Start at a teaspoon and see if that works for you. If that one doesn't work, then go to two teaspoons. But one tablespoon honestly is the sweet spot for me. And you can see the drop test with this is not great. Here's the drop test for the other, right? This is for the batches that had the water in them. No problem. No problem at all. So that's one of the things, one of the reasons why I think water is the best addition to a bath bomb, regardless of what else you're putting in it. Regardless of if you're using a shea butter or you're using, you know, SCI or SLSA or uh, cocoa betaine or whatever, regardless of the other additions, just looking at this with no other additions, just baking soda and citric acid, same with the oils and the fragrance. The only difference is the water. One batch is crumbling. It does not survive the drop test, which means it's not going to survive shipping. And the other batch is not. The other batch is rock hard. The other batch will survive shipping because the water is forming that crust. The water is very important. You need to start that fizzy liftoff reaction with the baking soda and the citric acid somewhat in order to ensure the stability of the bath bomb when it's all said and done. The water is very important. The water is important for the for forming of the bath bombs in and of themselves, but the water is also important for what happens when the bombs dry out and you are ready to package them and ship them. It really is the stability factor. Allowing the baking soda and the citric acid to interact just a little bit, form that crust, it's going to get you a long way. Again, you can play with the ratios depending on your humidity levels, but I have molded bath bombs with a tablespoon of water in, you know, 90% humidity and not had any problems. Now, we will get more in depth into the different additions and whatnot you could be using within these, you know, bath bombs that could potentially create problems, i.e. if you're putting in cocoa betaine, for example, and water. Yeah, things start to get a little weird because cocoa betaine has a lot of water in it. So we will definitely talk about that and how you can adjust for that as well as, you know, using FDNCs that have to bloom within water and whatnot within the rest of the videos in this playlist. But I think this is a really good jumping off point because bath bombs tend to confuse people quite a bit and they're always, you know, reporting again the problems of things being too dry or too wet, crumbling, warts, all the things. It's it's going to be all about that water content and not including water is actually a very bad idea if you want consistently good bath bombs. And again, this is just my experience. Take it for what it is, but that would be the biggest pro tip that I could give you, aside from always, always adding the citric acid absolutely last, right before you're ready to form. And there it is, three essentially batches of bath bombs, two including a tablespoon of water and one without. And as you can see, every single one of them that had the water in it, they survived the drop test. That really is the most important thing that you can include into your bath bomb recipes. And I understand why you might be hesitant to do it because your mind is going to go to, this is too wet, that's why I'm having these problems. Nay, nay. And through the rest of this playlist, I think you will understand why that, while it may seem logical, line of thinking is not really what you should be focusing on when you were dealing with bath bombs. Also, as I said in the video, while water is of course important, you can adjust that based on your humidity levels. I have made bath bombs in all manner of humidity conditions, and water is always, always necessary, but sometimes not as much water is needed, depending on your environment, which we will get into in the remainder of these videos. So definitely like and subscribe and do the things. Liking and subscribing tells me that you are interested in this content and you want to see more of it. That said, the majority of my year one content is becoming members only content very, very soon. So if this is the stuff that you guys still want to keep on the channel, you know, cause I don't know, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all the things. Thank you. Sudzers, thank you for existing. Thank you for being you. Like, comment, subscribe, all of the things. 
And as always, if you ever have problems with bath bombs and everything, you know where to find me. I'm in the Discord thing. So yeah, just go ahead and tag me wherever or at the Ask Mrs. Soap and Clay channel and that would be awesome. I'm going to go because I actually do feel something starting to sneeze and I don't want to do that on camera. So thank you. I will be right back for the next up in this Back to Basics Bath Bomb playlist. Bye. I don't think this white chair is the best idea here, especially if I'm wearing a white shirt. This has got to be messing up the white balance like nobody's business. Awesome. Can I fix that? Do I have a, like a, like a blanket? I don't know what to do here.